All right, I'm Dave Ratt, and today I'm going to do the third in the series of sound tips that I'm sharing for pro audio techs and audio humans in general, possibly. Um, before I get into them, I want to share that I'm going to open a membership area on YouTube um, where I'll be sharing videos before I release them to the general public, as well as um, exclusive videos, stuff that I won't be sharing with the general public, expanded topics that um, uh, I've never really been 100% comfortable with sharing like the business side of running a sound company, as well as um, some of the designs that I'm working on, uh, new sound tools products before they get released, I'll do something where when we get uh, a new product coming out, I'll announce it, I'll share it, I'll share some more development side of product manufacturing, and uh, I can do some, I'll put some discounts up. People here can, in the membership area, will be able to uh, get the products at a discount early on before we generally, general, generally release them to the public. Um, I'll do live chats, uh, depending on how many people, at least one a month. And if there's a lot of people sign up and it's not a one live chat isn't enough to really reach out and catch everyone and be connected, then I'll start doing more. Um, and just a community that's kind of buffered from the general public that um, I can just be comfortable sharing. It's something I've always wanted to do is I love to share the information. Um, but all of it, a lot of it isn't just fit for general public consumption. I'd rather have a uh, more of an elite group to share it with. Yeah, and um, let's see what else I got. Uh, I think that covers it. The live chats, exclusive video, early release, share info, expanded subjects, sound tools. Um, yeah, oh, on a desktop computer, you should be able to see a, uh, a join button. I'm going to charge $5 a month, so it's not really um, a significant expense there. $4.99, more precisely. And um, I might expand it. If it's popular, I'll expand it and even get deeper into that. Um, all right. Oh, and if, uh, if you're on a mobile phone, I think that you need a link, so I'll um, post that somewhere. I'll figure out some way to share that. All right, let's get on to some sound tips. Oh, before I do that, check this out. I've been um, 3D printing a little tiny monitor rig. These are scale versions of um, Micro Wedge 15s. Um, and... This is a scale version of a Micro Wedge 12. It was actually given to me. These pair, this pair was given to me by EAW when I first started licensing uh, the Micro Wedge to EAW. They printed these up, and they're mainly for show. They're not ported or anything. So what I did is I took and um, got into SolidWorks and I did a uh, 3D model, and it's got some porting and tuning in it. And I tuned them real low, and puffs of air come out the port. And, um, yeah, I'm building up a little 8-mix monitor rig, desktop monitor rig, so I can um, send things to different places and, um, I don't know, come up, hopefully come up with some um, interesting demos that I can do with that, having um, that kind of setup. I'm not sure exactly what I'll come up with, um, but something should come soon. This here is... The, homemade. I'll probably build a 3D print a better box for it, but this is actually a stereo mini plug in times four and then eight output. So this will be the power amp for the eight mix monitor rig uh, or maybe six mix monitor rig with left and right main PAs. I'll print up some little PA boxes. I don't know. We'll see where it goes. All right, let's get on to some sound tips. Uh, first one I got today Traveling around, using local PAs, going into a club, whatever you're doing. Uh, make sure you put a few extra fake inputs in your mic chart. Um, make something up. Cowbell, five cowbells, three hi-hats, two triangles, I don't know, whatever it is. Throw some extras in there. And that way you've got 
Uh, if a channel goes down, it buzzes on the local snake or something's wrong, uh, you've got a few spare places to go with that that are already tested and line checked. Uh, even if you run extra mics on stage, mic something up, put two mics or three mics on something you normally only run two mics on and um, just repurpose that as needed. Uh, and that way you have that safety net. Uh, next one. With test gear, it's easy to EQ a crap sounding square wave to look flat and even great sounding instruments can look terrible on an analyzer. And that highlights a couple different things. One is um, the flatness of an analyzing curve. When you get that RTA or that analysis and you get that flat, it's important to keep that in perspective. That could be a very, you could take a square wave and EQ it to flat and it could sound just like pure hash. Um, this first, this came up, this tip came to me through, um, I was doing some testing and I was using a smart on a laptop and I had a analyzer mic plugged into a box and I was EQing, every, I was testing uh, some speakers, I was measuring the um, response and I wasn't getting the measurement I was expecting. I was ending up with um, a response curve that didn't match what I felt I should have. And I started troubleshooting the setup. And what I found was that the, at the levels I was testing, the RTA mic that I was using was unable to handle the SPL levels that I was testing at. And it was distorting and square waving and creating extra high frequencies, which then caused me to EQ out some high frequencies which then meant it sounded dull when I played it back and it wasn't lining up. Um, and I found that by monitoring that input. So what I started doing was putting a Y cable on my analyzer mics and um, wiring it into another input. If you can't monitor it directly um, on a reliable piece of gear, why that analyzer mic into a spare console channel? and PFL that on the headphone. Make sure those RTA mics are clean and handling the SPL and there's nothing wrong with the mic or rattling or whatever is going, couldn't go wrong. Um, don't just trust that it sounds great going into the gear. And the same applies to the output signal. Um, if your pink noise, for some reason, your pink noise generator is battery operated, battery is low, or if it's um, distorted, that will give you an inaccurate um, signal which will cause again it'll cause flaws all right so make sure your test gear is functioning properly um ever mixing a show and someone shows up with a camera the xlr in hand media feeds production manager says okay we got three news stations coming tonight um and you put out your feeds one of them stereo Two of them are mono, everybody's hooked up, and all of a sudden the fourth and fifth media feeds show up and they're looking for a drop. Or they haven't told you about media, feed, media feeds at all, and you've got a couple cameras shows up, a couple cameras show up, and they want mic level inputs. Um, one good way to spit out those mic level inputs is to just grab two or three extra DI boxes, grab a pile of extra DI boxes come out the insert send with a quarter inch into the DI box or an XLR um, two quarter inch adapter into the quarter inch of the DI box and then daisy chain as many DI boxes as you want together. You can drive 20 DI boxes or more off of a console output um, or off the insert send of a AUG send or whatever you want. And um, that'll give you a as many mic level outputs as you have DI boxes. Um, next one. Um, oh, I covered two with that. Mix a show, need last minute media feeds, daisy chain DIs, and um, next one. Wide, uh, wider stack subs. I don't like, I don't want to cover that one. How about... Um, Hmm. Okay, let's go into mic patterns. When selecting mic patterns, uh, when selecting mics, 
be aware of the rear sound pickup. So cardioid mics, as we all should know or could know, is um, got maximum rejection, 180 degrees off axis, right down the tail of the microphone. And so when you have a cardioid mic, the optimum location for the wedge monitor is going to be right in front of the mic. And not just, you put one wedge right there, that's gonna be in its rejection pattern, but also setting the mic at a proper angle. If the mic is up like this with the tail end of the mic high, and you've got this pattern, think of, it, think of a cardioid pattern as a balloon, and you've poked your finger in the back of the balloon and created a, 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 an indentation. And then you take that, and that's where that maximum rejection is. So if you've got your mic set up and it's sitting horizontal, then your maximum rejection is horizontal out in the audience somewhere. If your wedge is down here, it is not in the maximum feedback uh, rejection zone. And if you want to get the feedback rejection, you have to tilt the mic such that the tail end of the mic is pointed at the wedge. Uh, that has a further advantage in that by tilting the mic upward, you're not pointing the primary pickup area of the microphone at the cymbals. You're pointing it up towards the ceiling more, which is um, advantageous or can be advantageous depending on the reflectivity of the ceiling. Um, with a super cardioid mic, they've got a little node that comes out the back. So imagine taking a balloon and taking a, a ring, some sort of ring-shaped device, and pushing that in such that it bubbles out in the back and there's that ring. Well, now that microphone, those rejection patterns of that mic might be here and here, but if you tilt the mic up, it ends up. So if you have a single wedge with a cardioid, super cardioid mic pointed flat, it'll be in the rejection pattern or up close to flat or at some angle here. And as you point the mic more and more up, that curvature separates your uh, rejection nodes farther apart where they strike the stage and the wedges will be farther apart. With a hypercardioid mic is closer to a figure eight. The node is closer to a figure eight cancellation at 90 degrees off axis than it is to a cardioid mic, which is 180 degrees off axis. So hypercardioid mics, actually, if you take a hypercardioid mic, and if I was sitting here and I pointed it upwards, those rejection patterns, you could actually get that rejection pattern so that the center pattern is actually directly behind me, which obviously I'm in the way of the wedge, but you can actually put the wedges behind a seated person using a hypercardioid mic pointed upwards and have the, micro, the, the wedges in the optimum uh, rejection zones of the microphone, which is actually really, really cool because you get this great look. You've got someone sitting there singing into the mic. The reflections off their face from the mic are bouncing away from the wedges and the wedges are firing up from behind um, I did that when I did um, Chris Cornell's solo gigs and um, I was setting the wedges up alongside him, almost uh, slightly behind him. And it was awesome because the mics on uh, the acoustic guitar were in front of the guitar. So all the sound from the wedge was blowing this way. And it was um, very effective and it looked cool because there was nothing between him and the audience. So I was really trying to connect the artist with the audience and bring him up close and personal and not have any distraction. And they could see all of him um, without any um, blockage. All right, I think that's it for today. Um, yeah, check out the member area if you're interested, join. If not, I'll still be posting videos for um, uh, public for free. And I've always been real accessible and sharing all the things that I wished people would have shared with me when I was an up-and-coming audio human and um, uh, supporting that angle. And um, I will be back with more videos soon.